Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Net Zero America. This webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance as part of our 100% Clean Energy Collaborative. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in via telephone or you can use your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled there. You can also click on that arrow to expand the webinar console. One of the things that you might like to do with that webinar console is to submit questions and comments. We're going to be saving about 15, 20 minutes at the end of our presentation for a Q&A with the audience. We do have a lot of people registered today, so we expect to get a lot of questions. So do type your questions and comments in as you think of them. Don't wait until the very end. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We'll send you an email following the webinar with a copy of the webinar slides and a PDF, a PDF of the slides and a video copy of the recording. And we'll also be posting those on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I'd like to now pass it over to our moderator for today's webinar, Warren Leon. Warren is the executive director of the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he is going to get us started. Hey, thank you very much, Samantha. Before I introduce our speakers, let me tell you a little bit about the Clean Energy States Alliance, which we affectionately call CESA. We're a national membership organization composed of public agencies, primarily state energy agencies from across the country. And all these organizations work together to share information, to uh, work on group projects and take other actions to advance clean energy, primarily in the electricity sector. And you can see the logos of our members up there on the screen. And one of the activities we do is the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative. We could go to the next slide. And the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative is an initiative that's open to any state that is engaged and thinking about moving towards 100% clean energy. And we also do a lot of public events like this one you're listening to today. I encourage you to go to our website to learn about the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative. The website is cisa.org. Well, let me introduce our two speakers who are going to talk about a report that's gotten a tremendous amount of attention and deservedly so because it's very important and has taken a very useful approach in sketching out various scenarios for how to get towards 100% clean energy. And our two speakers today are Eric Lawson and Jesse Jenkins. Eric Lawson is a senior research engineer and group head for the Energy Systems Analysis Group at Princeton's Andlinger Center for Energy and Environment. His research interests intersect engineering, environmental science, economics, and public policy, and his energy systems modeling and analyses aimed at identifying sustainable energy-based solutions to major energy-related problems. He co-led the Net Zero America project, and he's active in the Global Rapid Switch Initiative, which was established by the Anlinger Center. Now, our second speaker will be Jesse Jenkins, who's an assistant professor at Princeton University, and he has a joint appointment in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and at the Anlinger Center. He's a microscale engineer, sorry, energy systems engineer with a focus on the rapidly evolving electricity sector, including the transition to zero carbon resources, the proliferation of distributed energy resources, and the role of electricity in economy-wide decarbonization. He leads the Princeton Zero Lab, which stands for the Zero Carbon Energy Systems Research and Optimization Laboratory, which conducts research to improve decision-making to accelerate rapid, affordable, and effective transitions to net zero carbon energy systems. They're going to present 
their report, tell you about it, and then we'll have time for questions. Let me turn it over to Eric and Jesse. Great, thank you very much, uh, Warren. Um, let me see if I can get my screen going. Can we see the slides there? Looks great. Great. Um, yeah, thanks very much for having us. Um, and I should start by saying that um, there were a lot more people behind this report than just Jesse and myself. We had 18, a team of 18 folks working on it for almost two years. Um, so there's a, and there's a 350 page report, which um, we encourage you to go look at um, when you get time. Uh, we're gonna do a pretty high level summary of that over the course of about the next 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and the basic, the basic uh, objective that we set out to, to, to reach with this report was to answer the question, what does it really look like for the US to get to net zero emissions by 2050? Um, and, and sort of what are the implications of that uh, beyond the energy system for things like jobs and health and uh, capital mobilization and, and what happens to various industries? And, and what we think uh, distinguishes our study from a lot of the modeling studies that are out there is the, the, the high resolution that we've carried out in terms of spatial um, and sectoral analysis. So we've, you know, as you'll see, is when we go through some of our slides, we've done very fine scale modeling uh, geographically to understand what, what it would be happening where in the country over time. And by doing this very high resolution analysis, it lets us really quantify what the, what the challenges are and what the opportunities are as we go along this transition to net zero. And we end up with a, uh, essentially a, a blueprint for uh, the next decade of what needs to be done to be on a path in the longer term to get to net zero by 2050. And we, we make a point of not offering any specific policy recommendations because there's many ways that policies can, can help put us on the, on the track. But instead, we, we quantify sort of the physical and financial um, and social implications of uh, being on a net zero track. So with that as a quick introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse to go through some slides and, and I'll come back and finish up uh, towards the end. Jesse. Great, thanks, Eric. So in this study, we set out not to pick our best, our favorite pathway to net zero emissions or to uh, chart out the single best path, but rather to identify several different pathways, um, all of which can reach the net zero greenhouse gas emissions goal by mid-century using technologies that we know how to use today. So these are technologies that don't require some fundamental scientific breakthroughs or commercialization of technologies that uh, exist at a lab stage today. These are all resources that have been demonstrated at commercial or pilot scale. Oh, I think there we go. Um, uh, and so of course, any further innovations would be, would be help, even more helpful in expanding our toolkit. Um, but this, these pathways rely on, on technologies that are available. Um, and we, uh, you know, recognizing that there's great uncertainty about the path that we ultimately take to net zero, our approach was to try to identify uh, several key axes or dimensions with variation um, that is important to, to explore different trade-offs uh, and uh, impacts that we might see and the role of different technologies in reaching this goal. So here you can see the total primary energy supply of the United States today. These are our initial energy inputs into our uh, energy and industrial systems. And overwhelmingly, we get our energy today over 80% from uh, coal, gas, and oil, um, with smaller contributions from uh, renewables and uh, nuclear power in orange. We constructed a policy as usual or frozen policy reference scenario that assumes no additional policy decisions are taken uh, from today's level, very similar to what you would see in the Energy Information Administration's annual energy outlook. And you can see that under those uh, frozen policy conditions, we're nowhere near a net zero emissions world uh, with fairly modest changes in uh, the composition of our energy supplies going forward. A little less coal, a little more gas, a little more wind and solar, but more or less the same as today. In contrast, the five pathways that reach net zero are all pretty dramatically different and involve different combinations of the same core or key building blocks of a net zero emissions economy. They collectively explore three different key dimensions of differentiation or axes. Uh, the first being the degree of end use electrification of vehicles, buildings, and um, uh, building heating and uh, water heating. Uh, 
uh, and the second being the degree of biomass, uh, the role of biomass in the overall energy economy, and the third being the role of wind and solar power. So I'll just briefly describe these five scenarios since we'll be using them, uh, referencing them throughout the rest of the presentation. The first pathway, E+, plus, is the high electrification scenario, which involves uh, basically full saturation of electric vehicles um, and heat pumps uh, for water heating and space heating in buildings uh, by 2050. That involves about a 50% of new uh, light duty and heavy duty vehicle, uh, light medium and heavy duty vehicles sold by 2030 being electric or fuel cell vehicles. Um, and then their saturation increasing uh, thereafter towards about 100% of on-road uh, vehicles by 2050. That results in a significant reduction in primary energy demand uh, due to both energy efficiency measures, which are the same across all five scenarios, and additional improvements in efficiency uh, due to the higher efficiency of uh, final energy to service conversion of heat pumps and internal combustion uh, re relative to uh, boilers and uh, electric motors in electric vehicles relative to internal combustion engines. The E minus scenario is a delayed or less high electrification scenario, which reaches only about 50 or 60 percent penetration uh, by 2050. So still much more, a uh, much greater role for electricity in the economy than today, um, but by no means uh, a full electrify everything type uh, scenario in the E minus case. As a result, there's greater demand for liquid and uh, gaseous fuels in this scenario than in the E plus scenarios. And so the e B minus B plus variant is uh, the same end use demand for energy services, but with a greater supply of biomass available uh, as one option for carbon neutral uh, supply of liquid and gaseous fuels or negative emissions that would allow us to continue to use more uh, some fossil energy um, in the E minus scenario. In all of the other pathways, uh, we have the same level of constrained biomass availability, which limits the uh, available biomass supply to avoid any land use conversion of lands that are currently dedicated to agricultural or forestry production into bioenergy production. So that leaves us with the land that's currently used to grow corn for ethanol production, which is about 40% of the corn crop in the United States, um, which we already consider, we consider already part of the bioenergy economy and therefore part of the potential supply curve here as well as any sustainably harvested uh, bioenergy or biomass from uh, agriculture, forestry, and municipal solid waste. So that's the uh, green bar in the first two and last two scenarios, um, which you can see is all the same. Basically, we max out that usage in those cases and then relax that constraint in the B plus uh, variation to the full estimated supply of US uh, biomass from the US DOE and Department of Agriculture a billion ton supply curve study uh, and that would involve uh, conversions of lands currently used for agricultural or forestry products uh, and uh, into uh, bioenergy production. The last two scenarios uh, are both variations of our high electrification case, and they respectively push and pull on the role of renewable energy, which is unconstrained in the other cases. We allow the model to build uh, however much wind and solar it wants in the first three cases. In these last two, the RE minus case is a constrained renewable scenario in which we limit the growth rate of wind and solar to the maximum annual capacity additions that we've seen to date, which was about 35 gigawatts uh, achieved last year in, in 2020. Uh, and so that limits the role of wind and solar over time. They still grow significantly from today's level. Uh, but in order to make up for the shortfall in low carbon energy supplies in that scenario relative to E+, we see a much greater role for nuclear power, uh, the uranium uh, orange wedge there orange stripe, um, and a, a greater role for natural gas. Um, so this scenario has the, the, the largest uh, re remaining use of fossil fuels of all four of our scenarios. Most of that gas uh, supply goes uh, is used in, uh, in stationary sources like power plants and uh, hydrogen conversion with carbon capture and sequestration. And then finally, the RE plus case uh, is 100% renewable primary energy supply where all primary energy comes primarily from wind, solar, and biomass with smaller contributions from hydropower and geothermal. So in this case, we uh, tell the model to constrain and phase out the use of fossil fuels by 2050, uh, retire all existing nuclear and prohibit the construction of new nuclear by 2050. Um, and we also prohibit geologic storage of CO2 in this scenario. Uh, however, as you know, we'll note in further slides, and you can see in the bottom of the slide here, all of these scenarios capture substantial amounts of CO2, including the 100% carbon-free scenario, which captures about 700 million metric tons, uh, and then uses that CO2 captured from biomass and direct air capture uh, 
to produce synthetic fuels, uh, synthetic liquids and uh, natural gas substitutes, uh, which enable the complete elimination of fossil energy in that scenario. Next. What, we've, what we find is that all five of these pathways are affordable but substantial transformations of our U.S. economy. As a share of GDP spent on energy, um, we can see that all of these scenarios involve spending equal or less than the share of GDP that we've historically spent on energy throughout recent decades. We look back over the historical time series, we see both a significant amount of volatility in the share of GDP spent on energy, primarily driven by oil price shocks, which can send that share as high as 14% of GDP during the, the um, oil price shocks in the 1980s. Um, and we also see that during prosperous periods of American history, we've spent between five and seven or 8% of our GDP on energy services. Over the uh, course of this transition, the modeled pathways to net zero emissions, we spend about 4% of GDP across all pathways through 2040, uh, and between four and five and a half, six percent of GDP um, by uh, 2050 across the range of scenarios. Um, so, in other words, this doesn't require a World War II style mobilization or of you know 20, 25% of our GDP or a significant uh, sacrifice of uh, our economic prosperity to achieve these transitions. Instead, it involves spending about the same amount of, uh, of our economic activity or our wallets and, uh, and household uh, budgets and business budgets on energy services as, as we have historically, uh, especially during prosperous times in US history. Now, of course, uh, it's, we, we find that these pathways are more expensive than a uh, frozen policy reference scenario in which we don't attempt to reach a carbon-free energy system. Um, but the costs are relatively modest, about 3% increase in net present value of expenditures through uh, 2030, or about $300 billion. Um, and the, on the order of, I think, 2 to $4 trillion of increased annual expenditures by 2050. Um, or, but it's worth noting that this uh, nice smooth line here, um, of course, doesn't line up with what we've seen historically, right, with significant volatility and exposure of our economy to oil price variations. And we model here the same low oil and gas price trajectory in all of these cases, including the reference scenario. Uh, and you would expect that it, all else equal, greater demand for oil and gas in the uh, business as usual or reference world would mean higher prices, uh, which would push this curve up closer to the cost of the net zero transition scenarios. And furthermore, as we'll show in the end, um, we, the, these pathways deliver significant public health savings. Uh, avoiding uh, hundreds of thousands of premature deaths from air pollution, which are valued on the order of several trillion dollars of public health benefit, which is on the same magnitude as the net zero transition costs here. So cost in, is not really the central barrier anymore, thanks to significant cost declines in wind, solar, uh, and uh, batteries, which form the major cost of electric vehicles that we've achieved over the last decade. And if we use the next decade to similarly drive the maturation and improvement of costs for a range of other technologies we need to reach net zero, like carbon capture, hydrogen production from various sources, uh, and advanced clean firm electricity generation technologies, like advanced nuclear, geothermal, or power plants with carbon capture or hydrogen combustion, then we can reach these net zero goals um, with, uh, without uh, significantly impacting our, our economy. Uh, next. We also find that all of these uh, five pathways use the, uh, some combination of the same six key pillars of decarbonization. That means that while uh, you can't really remove any one of these uh, key pillars without the entire effort crumbling down, um, while, and so while we can vary the, our reliance on these different strategies, all of these are critical uh, building blocks or components of any uh, cost-effective pathway to net zero emissions that we've identified. The first is end-use energy efficiency and electrification, which help reduce the overall amount of energy supply infrastructure we have to build, and via electrification, reduce the use of liquid and gaseous fuels as much as possible, um, as those fuels end up being much more challenging to decarbonize and substitute for than providing clean electricity. The second component, then, is supplying clean electricity, primarily from wind and solar generation, supported by large-scale expansion of transmission. Um, and supplemented by and complemented by firm uh, power sources, which are available whenever we need them for as long as we need them to uh, complement and support the weather-dependent uh, wind and solar resources. 
The third uh, key building block or pillar is bioenergy and other zero carbon fuels and feedstocks. So while we can electrify much of the economy and to varying degrees in our different scenarios, there's still a significant demand for liquid and gaseous fuels for pipeline gas and heating um, in industrial processes and buildings and for uh, liquid transportation fuels like jet fuel or diesel. And we have to supply those fuels in a way that's carbon neutral or um, offsets the emissions from fossil energy used with negative emissions. So bioenergy and zero carbon fuels and feedstocks, including hydrogen, are an essential building block in all of our paths. The fourth, fourth piece is CO2 capture, utilization, and storage. Um, as we saw in the earlier slide, all of the pathways, including the 100% renewable scenario, capture substantial quantities of CO2, and then either use them for synthetic fuel production or sequester and store those emissions in geologic basins uh, to remove them from the atmosphere or avoid putting them there in the first place. Finally, outside of the energy and industrial activities that make up the first four pillars, which is the focus of our talk here, we also go into efforts needed to reduce non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible, including methane in the oil and gas supply chain and then from agricultural activities, uh, uh, refrigerants like HFCs, uh, and nitrous oxides from agriculture primarily. And then the sixth piece is enhancing and protecting our land carbon sinks. Uh, to uh, absorb as much CO2 in forest and agricultural lands and other lands uh, to help offset the remaining emissions of non-CO2 greenhouse gases that can't be entirely eliminated. Next. We find that uh, while these all of these building blocks are essential, we can, of course, vary their contribution. And what that leads to is a variety of different implementation challenges relative to a business as usual path that, are, that we're going to have to confront when executing the transition uh, to net zero emissions. And uh, so this graphic here shows several of those dimensions that we can quantify based on the findings of our results. There's probably other challenges that we're not depicting here, of course. But these are several of the key uh, infrastructure uh, and capital related challenges um, associated with building out a net zero emissions economy. And we rank all of these, uh, all five pathways from zero being the easiest to 100 being the most challenging on each of these axes. So it's an ordinal ranking of the five pathways. What you can see is that there's no single pathway that dominates all of the other ones, that's closer to the center uh, of the ring on every one of these axes. Instead, what we have is a set of complicated trade-offs between different implementation challenges. So for example, if we don't want to substantially rely on nuclear power or carbon capture and storage, then we may need to rely more heavily on solar and wind uh, capacity expansion, high voltage transmission lines, and greater labor or capital mobilization. If we want to constrain the role of bioenergy to, um, to reduce the role of, uh, of land use conversion, then we need to rely more heavily on electrification or face higher costs and capital mobilization requirements. So these different types of trade-offs are um, ultimately what differentiate the pathways and are likely to constrain and shape the path that we ultimately take as a country to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Rather than differentiation based on aggregate cost, it's these kinds of implementation challenges that we think deserve greater scrutiny and attention. Uh, and that's where most of our findings focus on trying to quantify, map, and make more visceral these sorts of scales of challenges and the trade-offs that we face across different pathways. Next. Um, so I'll round my section out here by talking about the electricity sector by, uh, before handing things over to uh, Eric. The electricity sector plays a pivotal role in all of our pathways, cutting emissions fastest and furthest of any sector of the economy and expanding dramatically by more than double across all of these pathways uh, by 2050 to electrify and displace fossil energy use, either directly through end use electrification or through the production of hydrogen uh, to displace uh, uh, fossil fuel use uh, in, in other sectors. Um, we also see that solar and wind are cornerstones in all of those pathways, with the deployment through 2030 being pretty consistent across four of the five pathways, uh, the ones where we don't constrain the annual growth rate of wind and solar. That, uh, the, what that means is the model robustly chooses to deploy between 550 and 600 gigawatts of new solar and wind capacity between now and 2030. That would mean uh, the enough energy to bring solar and wind from about 10% of our electricity supply today to about 50% uh, by 2030. So bringing up to half of our electricity from wind and solar over the next decade. That would mean deploying between 55 and 60 gigawatts per year of solar 
which would mean smashing new record rates for annual deployment each year. That compares to about 35 gigawatts achieved in 2020, um, and would mean by the end of the decade, probably hitting 75 gigawatts or so, or more than doubling the annual deployment rate that we've seen uh, to date. Um, now, in the RE minus case, you can see that we uh, deploy less wind and solar through 2030, retain more of our nuclear power fleet, and then expand in the longer term nuclear and natural gas with CCS to contribute more of the energy share uh, in that uh, RE minus case. And remember that this scenario is about the same cost as the E plus case. So the differentiation between those two pathways is not really one, uh, strongly differentiated based on cost but rather on the relative challenges, benefits, and trade-offs associated with relying more or less heavily on wind and solar power versus these firm low carbon resources like nuclear and gas with CCS. Fortunately, the growth in those technologies doesn't really need to be significant until after the next decade, which gives us more time to see how quickly we can deploy, successfully deploy wind, solar, and transmission, and, how, uh, and time to proactively improve and develop the suite of firm low carbon resources that can help um, create more options beyond the 2030s, uh, or be, from 2030 and beyond. Uh, just to point out, I guess finally on this slide, that the RE plus case, the 100% renewables case, uses about four times as much electricity as today by 2030, 2050, and about double that of the other cases. And that's because this scenario depends heavily on electricity to produce hydrogen and to some degree to run direct air capture devices in order to produce hydrogen and CO2 in carbon neutral ways to displace, uh, fully displace fossil energy use in that scenario. Uh, so this scenario is much more electricity intensive in order to uh, get rid of the fossil energy consumption and therefore requires about twice as much solar and wind and transmission expansion uh, and overall electricity supplies than the E plus case uh, without that constraint. Next. We uh, move from these sort of high level findings throughout our study to what we call detailed downscaling efforts that take the model results uh, that you've probably seen in other uh, similar studies of energy system models and move them to a much more visceral and human scale to try to understand where this infrastructure would have to be deployed across the country, when, and what the associated impacts on employment, air pollution, uh, and other uh, uh, land use and other challenges and benefits are across the United States. So here we can see our a map of our current wind and solar capacity with the blue areas being the spatial extent of current wind farms. If you look very closely, you can see some orange dots that are uh, existing utility solar, solar PV sites, although they're very difficult uh, to see at this scale. And when in the uh, gray in the background is our um, existing high voltage transmission lines uh, and the urban centers that uh, where, where our demand is concentrated. So this is where we're starting now. Um, click again. And by 2050, this is the spatial extent of wind and solar capacity across the United States in the E plus scenario, where we uh, leave the model to deploy as much wind and solar as is, the, is cost effective uh, in a net zero scenario. You can see the substantial land area um, uh, or the extent of the visual, uh, the, uh, the footprint of the wind uh, capacity across much of the middle of the country, large offshore wind expansion in the Northeast in particular and smaller uh, degrees in other regions. Um, and about a tripling, uh, or I should say, the, the solar capacity concentrated in the Southeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Southwest, and about a tripling of the total U.S. transmission capacity in order to support this deployment of about 1.5 terawatts each of wind and solar capacity by 2050. So in other words, it took us about 150 years to build the current transmission system, and we have to build the same amount of capacity in the next 15 years and then do it again 15 years after that in order to support this level of growth. So transmission is clearly gonna need a step change in the pace at which we're expanding and investing in transmission in the United States, something more on a nation building style mode than what we've seen in the past uh, few decades. If we wanna cost effectively or tap into all of this cost effective wind and solar potential across the United States and transmit that energy uh, to where it's needed. Next slide. While wind and solar play a pivotal role in all of these pathways, I do want to emphasize the importance of clean, firm generating technologies or resources that can produce energy whenever we need it for as long as we need it uh, and do so without CO2 emissions or with very low CO2 emissions intensity. Um, that includes technologies like combustion turbines using zero carbon or net zero carbon gases like hydrogen or synthetic methane 
uh, or uh, a blend of hydrogen and CO2 uh, and methane with negative emissions to offset the residual CO2 emissions, which is what the model tends to prefer in many of these scenarios. It also includes technologies like geothermal, bioenergy and natural gas with carbon capture, uh, and nuclear power, which can all contribute uh, to firm uh, power capacity and energy supplies. Today, we have about 950 gigawatts of firm generating capacity in the US. Most of that is coal and natural gas with about 100 gigawatts of uh, nuclear capacity. And what we see in all these scenarios is that it is cost effective to maintain as much of that existing nuclear capacity as is possible to safely continue operating uh, through 80 year asset lives even. Um, and then we need to, uh, uh, it, the model finds it's very cost effect effective to convert much of the existing uh, gas fleet to run on higher and higher blends of hydrogen um, uh, in order to reduce their car carbon intensity over time and take advantage of the low, lower capital costs of using existing gas fleets. Over all scenarios and all years, the models maintain a, between 500 and 1,000 gigawatts of firm generating capacity or about the same order of magnitude as we have today. So even as we expand wind and solar capacity, phase out uh, coal-fired power uh, over the next decade to reduce CO2 emissions uh, and air pollution, we still need to maintain a significant amount of firm generating capacity and to transition over time to cleaner and cleaner uh, clean for, uh, firm resource mix. Uh, over to you, I think, now, Eric. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, so Jesse's gone through the first two of our, our six pillars I'm going to run through the the third and the fourth pillar, and then talk a bit about the, the sort of the Im implications for for jobs and health and so on. Um, so this is another example of our downscaling effort around the bioenergy um, industry that evolves over the course of the transition. This is a map showing where where we're at by 2050, and the the pie chart shows you the sources of biomass supply, uh, residues from forestry operations and from crop production, and then the orange one representing conversion of, of uh, corn grown corn lands used for ethanol production to uh, more sustainable bioenergy crops like perennial grasses, which also then lead to additional soil carbon storage as well. Um, and what, what you see here is we've, we've started with a with an underlying county level database of, of, bio, of crop production and biomass supplies out of this uh, the DOE uh, billion ton study that Jesse mentioned. And that results in sort of a, a, a uniform grid of points of circles, which represent where you would likely build conversion facilities in order to limit the transportation distances that you have to take the biomass. Biomass is, is quite um, costly to transport long distances. And so it's gonna tend to be used where it's, where it's uh, located. Um, and then the other factor that uh, came into the analysis of siting of these conversion facilities is represented by the gray areas on the map. Those are uh, prospective storage, underground storage um, formations for CO2. And so as you can see, the light green colored circles represent biomass production of uh, conversion into hydrogen with CO2 capture. And that CO2 that's captured is then used, um, uh, sent through pipelines uh, for storage underground. And the model particularly likes this technology because it produces a carbon-free fuel, which is hydrogen or, or feedstock in some cases. Um, and the, the uh, carbon that's associated with the biomass, which is removed from the atmosphere when the biomass is growing, is then stored below ground, which effectively creates negative emissions. And those negative emissions are quite important and quite valuable as a result um, as, as we go further out into the transition. So you can see that the Midwest and the Southeast in particular become major bioenergy centers, much larger than they are today, $750 billion of capital invested in the rural, uh, rural America to build this industry. Um, and, it, and it's much larger than actually the, the current ethanol, corn ethanol industry by 2050. So that's the bioenergy industry. And my slides are locking. There we go. Um, so coupled with the bioenergy system is a CO2 uh, transport and storage system. And this is another area where we've done 
uh, some detailed downscaling analysis. This shows the high level results for 2050. The upper panel shows um, where CO2 is being captured by, by technology across the five different uh, pathways. And the lower uh, panel shows you what happens to that CO2, whether it's stored is the gray areas of sequestration uh, or converted into synthetic liquid fuels by combining it with hydrogen that's produced uh, in, the, in the energy system. And what you can see is that by 2050, there's large amounts of CO2 that are being um, captured and stored. Uh, a, a thousand million tons per year in the E plus case, that's a gigaton of CO2 per year. And that's, that's uh, primarily uh, stored as you can see in the lower panel. But in the other uh, additional scenarios where we have, for example, the, the RE minus case where we limited the growth of wind and solar capacity, we need additional storage there to offset the, the additional fossil fuels used. Um, you can see in the E minus case, um, the dark purple in the upper uh, panel in, uh, is uh, direct air capture, which is deployed significantly in that scenario. That's the case where we've not electrified the, the vehicle uh, system, the transport system as, as far as in the E plus case. And so we're using more fossil fuels again, and, and we need to offset through additional negative emissions beyond those that we can achieve with using the biomass, which we've, we've already back, maxed out the amount of biomass that we can use there. And so that's where direct air capture comes in. And just to put all these large numbers in perspective, a, a billion tons or a gigaton per year of CO2 at, at a reservoir storage pressure is on a volumetric basis is equal to about 30% more than the volume of the current US oil uh, production. So it's a substantial CO2 handling industry that and storage industry that develops across most of these scenarios. And in the in the one case where we don't allow storage of CO2, the RE plus case, um, we, we're still capturing 700 million tons there, uh, but using that to, to uh, make synthetic liquid fuels uh, because we're not allowing fossil fuel use uh, by 2050. And what we've done is built out um, the, how, how, how a uh, CO2 pipeline system might be built out over time. This shows you the, the endpoint snapshot, and you can see there's sort of two, two different networks, one to the, to the west of the Rockies and a much larger one to the east of the Rockies. And the circles represent point sources of CO2 that are where capture is going on. Uh, the green represents bioenergy. The blue represents cement plants, which uh, have emissions that would need to be controlled. Uh, and then you can see some orange plants with, which is natural gas power plants with um, CO2 capture. Uh, and you can see it's quite an extensive network that would be built out. The, uh, the trunk lines, the thickest trunk lines are running from the Midwest region down into the Texas Gulf Coast. And that's because the, the CO2 storage um, resource is largest in, in that part of the country. Um, roughly three quarters of the storage that's happening in 2050 would be would be going into the, the Gulf Coast uh, reservoirs. So it's quite an extensive uh, uh, CO2 system we would have. So stepping back a, a bit from, um, from the detailed modeling that we've done and coming back to one of these spider diagrams like Jesse showed earlier, this one now represents um, if we're successful with the transition, what are the impacts that we have as a society have have um, are, are living with or have accepted in some fashion or are benefiting from. And again, you can see that, uh, for example, there's an added land use in most of the scenarios, but to, to varying degrees um, across those. We have added pipelines and transmission lines, again, varying across different scenarios. We have added employment, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a minute, as well as health benefits um, and uh, so on. So there's, there's impacts that are, um, that would be that are implied by the the achieving the net zero goal that we've set out in this modeling and how these are traded off against each other will ultimately determine which pathway that um, you know we're going to follow to get to net zero in terms of employment we've we built a model for um, 
estimating the direct energy related jobs that would come out of this transition. These are results for the E plus scenario at a state by state level and decade by decade. And it, this shows the total uh, employment um, uh, across all sectors, but we have this disaggregated by uh, economic sector, for example, construction jobs versus manufacturing jobs and, and uh, jobs in solar versus wind versus, versus bioenergy versus grid uh, operations and so on. Um, so there's a lot more detail behind these in, in our report, but in, in aggregate over the country as a whole, the, it's a very positive employment story over just the next decade if if in the e plus scenario it's it's on the order of half a million uh direct energy energy related jobs uh on top of what a business as usual scenario would sh would show and and the employment is higher in some of the other scenarios uh and so you can see uh, overall it's quite positive but there are uh, some places where job losses would be expected if under under the assumptions that we've made in our modeling for example in west virginia you can see in the first decade, there's a loss of employment there, which is a result of shutting down of the of the coal industry pretty much completely by the by 2030. So there are some um, shifts that will need to be managed to 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 uh, help balance the uh, the costs across society as well as distribute the benefits. We've also then modeled the the uh, impacts of air pollution, and this is these are county level. Um, uh, estimates of premature deaths due to either uh, coal-fired coal power plant emissions in the upper map or motor vehicle emissions in the lower map. This is the current situation in the U.S. Uh, and by 2050, across most of the scenarios, <clears throat> we've eliminated essentially all of that pollution uh, from coal and as well as from motor vehicles by, by the electrification of the vehicle fleets. And we've avoided uh, on the order of 200 to 300,000 premature deaths, and and that's value has an economic value of on the order of two to three trillion dollars. Um, we're doing additional modeling on this that's looking at other um, health impacts uh, outcomes other than just premature mortalities. Um, but so this is sort of a lower a lower end estimate of the of the benefits on the health side that would come out of a, a, a transition. So just to to finish up. Um, this is this is what we call our, our policy to do list. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we haven't proposed specific policies that we would recommend for achieving the net zero goal. But but this um, graph shows you what we think needs to happen in the next decade in order to be on a path um, uh, to to net zero and and the way that um, um, that this to-do list will get done is through good good policy implementation, and and this this list is is pretty much the same across all five of our pathways. As Jesse mentioned on the electricity sector, the first ten years or so of the transition is quite similar across all of the transitions, and so um, we can we by by investing in these um, measures that are shown here, uh, we can be pretty confident that they're going to return value over the longer term, regardless of which direction we go with the net zero transition. And so what this shows is that we need a lot of investment in wind and solar in the, on the left left hand side there, as well as electricity transmission in the lighter blue. And we need to begin building out, designing and building the CO2 transport trunk line systems that I showed you um, are in place by 2050. We need those to, to begin to happen in the 2020s in order to provide confidence to investors um, who are investing in carbon capture plants, which are needed in much larger quantity in the 2030s and 2040s. In the in the buildings and appliance area and vehicles, these are consumer costs that that um, are go going to be uh, in excess of a business as usual cost. And so, electric vehicles are still a little bit more expensive than conventional vehicles during this decade. Uh, heat pumps for space heating in homes are more expensive than than gas furnaces, for example. So there needs to be additional capital um, in, that goes into those um, those end uses. Uh, on the far right side, we see the industrial investments. Uh, productivity of industry needs to be improving steadily as it has historically, uh, and that that uh, requires capital investment. 
Um, in the lower right corner, we have something called option creation. And this is um, investment in new and development of technologies that we we basically understand how they work today and, and have been demonstrated at, at, a, at a small scale. But to have these technologies ready to be commercially deployed in the 2030s requires much more investment today to get them ready to be deployed. Uh, and these are things like, depending on the scenario, um, advanced nuclear, biomass gasification for hydrogen production, um, electrolysis for hydrogen production, and a number of others, which we detail out in our in our in our report, um, to have to to basically do with these technologies what what uh, government investment has done for solar and wind technologies, which has dramatically reduced the cost to the point where they can be commercially uh, deployed. And it's a similar idea that we have in the option creation box there. So on the whole, it's it's two and a half trillion dollars of capital, additional capital investment over um, a business as usual over the next decade. And it's important that this is viewed not as a cost because it's not a cost, it's an investment. Um, one, when one buys a house, they, they take out a mortgage, which is the capital, um, and pay that back over time, which is the, the, the annual cost. And so the annual cost, when it's annualized, is not um, as Jesse uh, pointed out, is not too different than historical costs, but it needs upfront investment, uh, which is quite different than, than the conventional uh, business as usual history. Um, yeah, this is just our, our list of eight priorities I of, uh, for the 2020s. I won't go through them in detail. I'd like to leave time for, um, for questions. This slide pretty much summarizes what's on that next one. So I think we'll stop there and welcome questions. Hey, thanks very much. That was great. And I'm gonna jump right into the questions because we have a large number of them and try to get to as many as we can. Several people asked about transmission, how politically realistic it is that we would actually get that amount of transmission investment. And also have you considered the long lead time it takes to actually implement transmission investments, even if you get the money for them. Jesse, you want to take that one? Sure. So we did uh, think about the lead time. So one of the things we break down in the report is the staging of pre-final investment decision related investments that need to be made to develop projects to the point where you can actually make a go, no go decision about investing in them. Uh, and then the construction times required as well as the fact for long distance transmission that for many of the longer lines, you're gonna to wanna to build those lines in advance of the wind and solar projects because it's unlikely that developers will uh, build out unless they're confident that the transmission interconnection is going to be available. So we stage all of that into the build out and that's partly why you need such a substantial uh, expansion over the next decade um, because that's not just to meet the needs of connecting 600 gigawatts of wind and solar, but also to prepare for the next 600 gigawatts or so that you need to build uh, in the next decade, so there's a, or the next five years, so that we, we sort of try to uh, uh, bake that into the scenarios. And I think what you see across a number of these fronts is that the scale of transition required is really unprecedented, or is at least a step change from what we've been doing over the last couple of decades. And so that argues that that change has to occur pretty much immediately. Uh, we're already on our back foot, you know, and, and some of the investments that the model wants to build in 2022 or something are should have already begun by now. And, and if they haven't, then we're going to be behind the trajectory that is outlined in the modeling. So I think it, you know, it, 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 it um, highlights the urgency of, of getting a clear policy direction in place soon to, um, to, to make those kinds of investments at scale possible. You know, whether expanding transmission at the scale that we're talking about is possible, you know, it's hard to say. Clearly, it's not going to be with the current, uh, you know, business as usual approach to transmission development and siting, which has not been building anywhere near this much capacity. Um, but that's not to say it's not possible to change that approach. Um, and whether it's harder to build out the transmission or to restart a nuclear sector or to build a national CO2 pipeline network, I, I can't say. And that's, you know, our, our approach here is to try to elucidate those trade-offs and to focus the conversation much more on those sorts of challenges and less on you know, sort of arguments between favorite technologies or questions about the sort of overall cost of transition. 
Um, the cost minimization is important. I do that for a living as an optimization modeler, but um, well, I think what we're seeing in the results here is that it's these practical implementation challenges and the distribution of both benefits and impacts that people are gonna have to live with that are gonna determine um, which pathways are feasible and can secure political support and social you know, uh, consensus uh, and which are unlikely to be, uh, be able to proceed. Great. Uh, several people asked about geothermal, why it doesn't feature more in more scenarios, and even in the scenario it features, it's just a very small wedge in the total amount. The main reason is that we don't model any advanced geothermal technologies. We only model conventional hydrothermal resources, which have pretty limited development potential and only really in the Western states. So if you go in there, there is, I think, a doubling or so of, trans of, of hydro capacity, I mean, of a geothermal capacity, but that's on the order of, a, you know, 10 gigawatts or so, not the 1.5 terawatts of wind or solar that you see, you know, setting the axis for that chart. Um, and so it just doesn't really uh, show up in the capacity build. Uh, maybe to anticipate some other questions, we also didn't really emphasize energy storage in our discussion. Uh, battery storage, that is, and that's partly because, again, it, it's an important, it grows a lot from today's levels. I think we have about 200 or 250 gigawatts of storage in uh, the capacity results by 2050, um, which is maybe on par with, you know, the current open cycle gas turbine capacity, so not nothing. Um, but it also just doesn't really rise to the level of kind of first order takeaways and, and key challenges. I think that, you know, building out and scaling up the storage sector is going to be a relatively easy uh, endeavor relative to the scale of transmission and wind and solar and clean firm generating capacity needed uh, in the power sector. Good. So, you know, everybody's been thinking about Texas these days and to what extent watching what's going on in Texas, does that question or make you think any differently about what you did in your uh, scenario analysis as, for example, one person asked, you know, considering what's happened in Texas, is it really feasible to have reliable grid infrastructure to support full electrification? Yeah, so, uh, do you want to go, Eric? No, go ahead. You just wrote an op-ed on that, so. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think there's a couple of key takeaways for me that I think just reinforce, you know, some of the key takeaways of previous work as well, which is that, you know, wind and solar are going to supply a very large portion of the energy we need, right? At least maybe half by the next, uh, by 2030 and 70-80% in some of these scenarios by 2050. But that doesn't mean we can eschew the kind of um, uh, firm generating capacity needed to get through periods of extreme weather events. Um, I, I called the wind and solar uh, reliably unreliable in the op-ed I wrote for the New York Times to try to emphasize this point that pl energy system planning should not depend on wind and solar resources to be available at much, you know, above a nominal capacity factor uh, during times when the system is stressed. We need firm resources that can uh, play that role and act uh, at those times to ensure reliability and meet peak demands. And of course, we rely on fossil generation to do that today. Um, and when those resources that we count on to be dependable turn out to fail, as is what happened in Texas, with the loss of about 28,000 gigawatts of forced thermal power plant outages, mostly natural gas plants. That's when these sorts of crises um, really turn into catastrophes. So for me, it's I think it reinforced the need for significant firm capacity and to actually ensure that those supplies truly are firm uh, and actually are there when you need them and can be counted on. And I think in particular, given that our modeling depends a lot on hydrogen uh, in gas turbine power plants, um, the sort of vulnerabilities of a just-in-time fuel delivery system uh, that may not be fully weatherized or resilient to extreme events, as happened in Texas, uh, raises questions about how we would need to ensure uh, on-site storage or adequate fuel deliverability and weatherization of those systems to make sure that those hydrogen combustion turbines actually have the fuel they need uh, during sort of extreme events like that. I don't know if you want to add anything, Eric, on the supply yeah, side. I, 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 would, I would just add that uh, in our models, the uh, those firm technologies that Jesse's referring to, combustion turbines, they operate at very low capacity factors. So we have a lot of capacity, but we're not using it very often. Um, and the electricity markets today are not designed to incentivize that structure within the electricity um, grid system. And so that that's going to require changing the way the market operates at some level to be able to make sure that the capacity is valued 
uh, properly, even though it's not used very often or because it's not used very often. Maybe just add a wrinkle of that. I, I think that the, the short run markets value that pretty well, but there is a need for long term hedging arrangements that avoid um, the significant risk exposure that a generator that depends on, you know, an event once every three years to make all their money would otherwise have, you know, so some somebody's going to ask for a pretty high cost of capital to finance a plant that's fully exposed to that sort of volatility. Whereas if um, we can hedge the, those power plants in different ways um, through a variety of long-term contracts, either mandatory or not, then we can uh, more readily address the financing costs for those sorts of resources. Um, the other thing is that we do need to see a lot more demand side flexibility, uh, not for sort of days, right? We're not going to flex our way through a five-day blackout, but we can see a lot of enhanced flexibility from especially a lot of the newer loads that are going to be electrified, like electric vehicle batteries and uh, water and space heating, particularly water heating. If you have a, you know, a, a water heating tank, you've basically got a big thermal battery. And so you don't need to, you know, use your electricity as soon as you turn on the shower. Um, you can, uh, with automation and controls that are relatively inexpensive, we can control when those vehicles and water heaters and other devices charge. And that can allow us to use a lot more wind and solar more flexibly without needing significant uh, increases, with, with um, reducing the increases in distribution uh, and transmission network capacity that we need uh, in peak, you know, peaking generating capacity um, and uh, battery storage. So we see a direct trade-off in our model between the degree of flexibility in demand uh, for those sorts of flexible loads and the amount of battery storage that we have. So if we assume more aggressive assumptions about load automation and flexibility, we need even less batteries. If we assume less flexibility, then we need more batteries. There's a pretty direct kind of one-for-one -one competition between uh, battery storage and uh, demand flexibility on that hourly time scale. Uh, and either of those are critical to shifting the peaks around so that we don't have quite as uh, significant a peaking uh, load, particularly in winter uh, winter months uh, overnight uh, for heating needs, which is what drives the, the peaks in a highly electrified scenario. Good. Let me switch gears and talk about biomass. We got quite a few questions about that and people questioning, well, is it really carbon neutral? And have you taken that into consideration when you create scenarios with such high amounts of biomass use? That's a good question. And that's, that's exactly the reason that we designed the scenario for four of our pathways without, with the assumption that we're not going to use additional land to what's being used today for, for bioenergy in the US because that eating into to, uh, to new cropland, for example, converting cropland has the concern of an indirect um, emissions being generated by conversion of land somewhere else in the world. Um, so that was the motivation behind designing the, the bioenergy scenario the way we did. <clears throat> but we also then looked at a, at a more extreme scenario, which was the B plus case where we allowed um, some land conversion to, to bioenergy. We didn't explicitly um, change the, the rules on, on carbon balance for biomass between those scenarios. So we still assumed that the biomass was carbon neutral and one can, one can have a, a disagreement about that, um, certainly. But on the whole, we were, we, the majority of our scenarios are designed to, to essentially be carbon, to, to use biomass as a carbon neutral source. Okay, thank you. And in terms of the um, carbon sequestration, what sorts of geological formations would you be using for all that um, carbon sequestration and why is it in some parts of the country and not others? So oh, so that's um, <clears throat> just have, has to do with the geolo geologic history of the area. If you look look where oil and gas are today, uh, largely in the Gulf Coast region, th those are the those are the formations that have stored carbon for millennia, and those happen to be the best uh, in terms of storing CO2 if we're going to put it back down there. So that, in a in a sort of a very simplistic way, that's that's the the reason for the geographic specific specificity. Um, you know, these these formations are typically porous um, sandstone type. Uh, formations. They they don't appear porous physically, but they actually have a lot of pore space in them. Um, and there's been quite a work, quite a bit of work done um, around the U.S. and and elsewhere on 
demonstrating um, and understanding the geologic storage resource. Hey, thanks very much. You know, we've come to the end of the hour. There are a lot more questions. I'm sorry we can't get to them, but this is a very rich report. I encourage everybody to go out and take a closer look at it. And I really want to thank Eric and Jesse for excellent presentations today. And I hope that everybody on the call will join us for future presentations of the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative and of other CESA programs. So thanks very much now. Thanks, Warren. Thank you, Warren. I know.